Good morning, members and friends of Calvary. I hate to have to break up your fellowship. It's good to hear all your conversation. It is 9 o'clock, and we will begin to get started with worship. There are a couple of announcements I think we should bring forth. Um, you'll see the insert in your bulletin, first of all, which we will get to in a moment. But uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock at First United Methodist Church is our annual charge conference, which I guess you could somewhat equate to a business meeting, but it is also a time to share ministries together. Uh, we will be joined with the Cambridge Church and led by our district superintendent, Reverend He Chan. And so uh, that is the time when we vote on our uh, church officers for the year, set salaries and that type of thing, but also share our ministries together. Pastor Steve will be the presiding elder at another section of the church conference, so he will not be present at ours, but we welcome you to come and participate and share ministries and uh, be a voting member if you are a member of the church. Um, secondly, there was a letter out on the table outside, I hope you guys have picked one up, that is going to be um, explaining the meeting that will be happening here at Calvary next Sunday. As we all know that there has been uh, talks for some time about a, an amicable split in the United Methodist Church between the progressive side and the traditional side and all of the talks and delays that have been going on about that. Uh, the Wesleyan Covenant Association is in the process of being a part of the founding of a potential new church called the Global Methodist Church. And this presentation will talk about where we are, a little bit about how we got there, and about what the future may look like. So we will host this for Central Iowa here at Calvary next Sunday, and we invite you to take part in that as well so that you feel educated and prepared to um, make that decision when and if the time comes. And then finally, today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And I read a stat from Open Doors Ministries this morning that said that there are 340 million Christians suffering persecution worldwide. We may feel like our rights are stepped on once in a while in the United States, but there are people imprisoned, their homes are torched. There's been a kidnapping just this past week in Nigeria of 100 worshipers that were kidnapped from a church. So there's just so much going on in the world that we need to be praying for. And uh, Hebrews chapter 13 tells us this, that we should remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves are suffering. So that is a command from scripture for us to remember our persecuted brothers and sisters in prayer, to lift them up, uh, to find ways to support ministries that support them. So I invite you to read your insert, and there are a couple of great ministries if you have further interest. Uh, Voice of the Martyrs, which is persecution.com, and then Open Doors USA are two that are very good um, ministries that are serving the persecuted church. So as we begin to think along those lines, our opening hymn today is number 529, and this talks about how anytime we are going through anything, we have the foundation of Jesus Christ as his church, that he will be with us, he will never forsake us. So this is number 529, How Firm a Foundation, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. If you are able to stand, we invite you to do that. If you are more comfortable in your seat, uh, that is perfectly fine as well. Number 529.
You may be seated. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12. The entire chapter is really very good, so I encourage you to read that at home. But for this morning's purposes, it's chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and verse 21. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe fran movie franchise, uh, which includes the Avengers, uh, the Iron Man series, uh, Captain America, and the Guardians of the Universe movies, um, are the highest grossing movie franchise of all time. So far, it has raked in revenue over $22.56 billion, that is with a B, U.S. dollars, and it's still going. The next four highest grossing film franchises uh, are Star Wars, Harry Potter, James Bond, and The Lord of the Rings. And together, uh, they have uh, grossed over $50 billion. The question is, why are people flocking to these movies? What is it about these movie franchises that attract us? Now, there are probably a lot of reasons. Uh, people all over the world really have a common concern, and that is the battle against evil. We all sense that, that evil is out there. I mean, daily we are reminded that there is evil in the world. And, and we desperately want a hero, someone who can overcome that evil. And so we have these superheroes, or very talented heroes, who come in, do battle with evil, and in the end, they win. It may look bad for a while, but, but they win in the end. Those of us who in, are trying to live as followers of Jesus Christ will come face to face with evil. We will be opposed. It's one of the promises that Jesus made that we wish he wouldn't keep. We have a source, though, of power that is much better than these superheroes that we celebrate um, in these movie franchises. This superpower is more powerful than evil, and of course we know that that superpower is God. As Cindy alluded to, uh, we uh, are observing the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. We have brothers and sisters throughout the world who are experiencing uh, evil at levels that we can only imagine. We think that uh, we're persecuted when somebody makes fun of us because of our faith or uh, doesn't allow us to exercise our um, freedom. But there are people in, in the world who are uh, facing torture, facing death every day just because they're Christians. And this is uh, one of those days where we can focus and, and um, be in solidarity with them. 
We were called to pray for them. And uh, the voice of the martyrs, the, the, the uh, group that um, prepares the materials for this day, um, has a, a, a Facebook uh, page where you can go and, and see prayer requests. So you just, if you're on Facebook, you can look for Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, I'm sure they're probably on Twitter and all those other uh, platforms as well. But it's good for us uh, to be mindful of the, our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are facing persecution and then to pray for them. But I also want to say that that these uh, brothers and sisters throughout the world are great examples for us. They're great inspiration for us. And today, as we look at these uh, few verses in, uh, in Romans, uh, I want to uh, really direct our attention to the fact that we have an overcoming faith. And here in Romans, we see how we can access that faith and uh, come into solidarity with our brothers and sisters throughout the world. So the first thing uh, that we need to understand is the source of this overcoming faith. Where does overcoming faith come from? And the short answer is that it is a gift from God. Uh, without God, there is no faith. And uh, what we put our faith in is, is important because you can have faith in something that really can't do anything for you. I can have faith that uh, this paper in front of me uh, will save me from persecution and I would be uh, putting my faith in something that is just not going to help me. So the Apostle Paul makes his appeal to us in verse 1 by the mercies of God. God's mercy is offered to us solely through Jesus' death on the cross. And it is by this mercy that we can develop the kind of overcoming faith that enables us to present ourselves as the living sacrifices that Paul appeals to us to be. Now, presenting ourselves as living sacrifices doesn't sound too appealing, does it? I mean, who wants to be a sacrifice? Because uh, in the Old Testament, uh, what uh, and the, the reference here is really to the Old Testament, uh, sacrifices died. The sacrifice was killed and offered on the altar. Paul tells us to be living sacrifices. We don't become living sacrifices accidentally. As biblical disciples, we present ourselves as instruments of righteousness. We forsake sin in our lives because we have been brought from death to life in Christ. So we have joined Christ in his death that's the, the dying part, but we are living sacrifices because Jesus is living in us. So being living sacrifices is a daily choice. We daily decide to die to self, to kill the self, and to live for Christ's sake. Because we know that that's the kind of life that really matters. Living sacrifices dies so that Christ may live in and through them. Christ living in and through me embraces the position of a servant. We, we look to serve other people rather than lord over them. And, and Jesus was the example here. He, is, he was the, the one who came down from heaven. He, he gave up his rights as God. It's one, one of the Trinity. And he came and he served us and really continues to serve us. And so Christ living in me uh, as a living sacrifice compels me to live as Christ did, to do what Christ did, to submit to what God wants us to do in all things. 
Jesus modeled that for us. And so it is Christ living in me that enables me to do what seems to be humanly possible, impossible. It, it means uh, forgiving our enemies, praying for our enemies, our persecutors. It means loving them, doing good for them. And here's where uh, our brothers and sisters throughout the world can become our uh, examples. There was an Indian Christian, uh, the Christians Kandi and his wife Bindi, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, they were uh, great examples of living sacrifices. Armed Hindu extremists approached Kandi's home in India, angry that he would not renounce his faith in Christ. Kandi told his wife, Bindi, <clears throat> no matter what happens to me, you should not give up your faith in Jesus. Kandi and Bindi continued living for Christ, praying and trusting God each day. After uh, repeated harassment, Kandi was killed by Hindu mob. Bindi's father suggested that she stop following Jesus. But she replied to her father, she repeated something that she remembered Kandi once saying. She said, I will live for, Christ, for Jesus or die for Jesus, but I will never turn back. Those who have died to self are willing to live for Christ or die for Christ, no matter what. Now, to be a living sacrifice, according to this text before us this morning, means that we live holy lives that are acceptable to God. Now, this idea of holiness has become tarnished over the years because we often respond to caricatures of holiness. Uh, we think of uh, the person that is, as we say, holier than thou. Uh, so we get this idea that, that a holy person is someone who walks around with a dour look, um, always looking like they are sucking on lemons, and they think they're better than everybody else, and they pronounce the do's and don'ts of Scripture with relish, but that's not really accurately what holiness is. The Greek word that is translated here as holy that means separate, set apart, sacred to God for a special purpose. So yes, there's a, 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 an element of separateness, but... Um, we, we really don't separate ourselves from the world. We separate ourselves from the world's thought patterns. We give ourselves completely to God. So our holiness should point to God's holiness uh, and is God who is completely, utterly holy. Holiness is, is really a process rather than a one-time event. If you think you've arrived completely in holiness, um, you need to go back to Scripture and, and see the truth. It's, we're, we're all uh, on the process. We're all on the road to holiness. So holiness is developed in our lives day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. We just keep working on it. And we do this until um, Jesus finally has his way with us completely. Now, Paul tells us that a, being a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable to God is our spiritual worship. Now, other translations, uh, other than the ESV that I use, uh, will uh, render this as reasonable service or true worship. Uh, what, does, what does this 
phrase exactly mean? Well, the Greek word Paul uses here for worship is latria. Latria. Paul's original Jewish readers would have immediately understood this to be the sacred service that the priests completed in the temple. The priest would go to the temple and would offer the sacrifices on behalf of the people. But Paul wanted to make the point that Jesus, as the, as the priest, offered sacrifices so that we could offer ourselves as living sacrifices. So it wasn't the dead sacrifice that the priests offered in the Old Testament, it's the new sacrifice, the living sacrifice. It's giving our, uh, our entire selves, including our body, to be sacrifices. S- the, the spiritual worship of biblical disciples is not compartmentalized then. It's not something that we do on Sunday. We're not holy on Sunday and then uh, live our lives the way we want to the rest of the week. It's not something we do on Sunday morning for an hour or two. It is not a gathering for church weekly or uh, even a daily devotional or a family altar. All those things are all important. Don't get me wrong. But if, if that's the only time you're holy, then you miss the point. Our spiritual worship expressed as reasonable service is to live our lives daily for Christ's purposes. And if we are going to experience this overcoming faith, we need to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. But secondly, we also need to have our minds transformed. We have to have our minds transformed because uh, if, if we try to hold on to our old way of thinking, uh, we'll never be able to, to make that move to become living sacrifices. I like the way uh, in verse 2, Paul says, uh, do not be conformed to this world. And, and I like the way that, that J.B. Phillips paraphrases this verse. He says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within. And that's what what it means not to be conformed. This word for conformed means to to put in a mold that that makes you you look like the rest of the world. Paul says, "Don't don't let the world squeeze you into that. Don't let it happen. Instead of letting the world squeeze us into its mold, we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are to live out the transformation that is lived in us. God's grace transforms us from sinful creatures to holy creatures belonging entirely to God. So this idea of holiness is a cooperative venture. We can't be holy without God's work in us, but we also can't be holy if we just uh, sit back and and let God do all the work. We need to work out what he has worked in. And the renewal of our minds provides us with a, a perspective that allows us to see the futility of the world's thinking. If God has, has renewed our minds, we can see the, the, the senselessness of the way the world thinks. The world is constantly trying to bend us to its will. And if we're not on our guard, we will drift that way. If we're not allowing our, ni- our minds to be renewed, we will easily succumb to the world's way of thinking. Because you know, the world's way of thinking is very subtle. Daily we see it in, in the movies we watch, in the books we read, in the, in the news outlets we, we choose. The way we converse with other people. But when our 
minds are renewed, we will be able to see how God wants us to think. We will be able to engage the culture around us rather than just accepting everything we hear. Our renewed minds will help us discern between God's will, which often appears less desirable, and the world's will, which looks good at first, but leads to death. You see that, can't you? I mean, uh, which do you want to be? Uh, a living sacrifice or someone who grabs uh, all that you want, all that you think you deserve, which is what the world tells us to do. Jesus models for us the kind of discernment that differentiates between the deception of the world's will and the goodness of God's will. Uh, the Jews in Jesus' day were, were looking for a Messiah. And their idea of a Messiah was a political uh, Messiah, one who would come, would uh, shake off the shackles of the Roman uh, oppression that they were under and become their king, their champion. And they were ready to, to make Jesus that and, and to do it by force. And it had to have been tempting for Jesus. I mean, just think, you know, I could just become king here. Uh, I, I could be a good king. I wouldn't have to go to the cross. I wouldn't have to, wouldn't have to go through that pain. But Jesus said no to the world's way of thinking because he knew that that was a dead end. He had a clear mind. He had a, tr a transformed mind, if you want to say that, although his mind didn't have to be transformed. He obeyed God and he went to the cross, which led to his glory and our salvation. You see, what, what the the people in Jesus' day wanted was, was a political king which in the end would have not saved them at all. What they got was a Messiah who died which is senseless to them but in the end that is what saved them. So God's way of thinking is different from our way of thinking. But we need to submit to God's way of thinking if we're going to be saved, if we are going to have overcoming faith. Now, if God is the source of overcoming faith, we can be certain that we will experience victory of overcoming faith. The victory of overcoming faith is a victory over evil. But this victory is not the kind of victory that most people have in mind. It's not the, the, the good guy coming in and pulverizing the bad guy and winning that way. It's not about violence. It's not about uh, uh, overcoming with the will. Instead, it is the fulfillment of the imperative in verse 21. The whole chunk of this passage that we that we kind of skipped over because we don't have time. But it says, do not, overcome e uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. If we are living sacrificial holy lives, we will face opposition. It's guaranteed. As I said earlier, that, that's one thing that, that Jesus guaranteed. We would be opposed. Paul said it as well to Timothy. He said, uh, if, if we try to live holy lives, we will be persecuted in one way or another. These people that come against us trying to do evil to us or trying to silence us, trying to get us to, to go away from what God has called us to do. Paul doesn't say, if you face evil, he says, when you do it. Biblical disciples must not be disheartened, however. We must not be discouraged. We must not be derailed by evil. 
We need to stand firm because our faith is in the one who overcomes. And when Paul tells us not to be overcome by evil, I think he has three types of evil in mind. Uh, And it might surprise us what the first type of evil is. The, The first type of evil is our own flesh. The most difficult evil that we will face is inside us. We are all capable of evil. Our heart uh, without Christ is wicked, and it will drive us to do wicked things. Evil is not always something outside working on us. It is something often that is inside us leading us away from Christ. There's a battle raging inside each of us between the old self and the the new self, the new transformed self. And so to, to successfully overcome the evil that resides in our flesh, we must deliberately put on Jesus. We must consciously say, today I'm going to put on Jesus. I'm going to take off the old clothes, the old way of thinking, and put Jesus on. We must kill the flesh, not coddle it. Remember a cartoon that I saw, you know, I think it was in Leadership Magazine, Leadership Journal, and, and a woman at a Bible study was saying, uh, well, I, I haven't exactly killed the old self, but I did feel faint once. It's n- it's not about just feeling faint. We got to kill it. We got to get rid of it. If we don't kill the flesh, the flesh will kill us. We must commit to walking daily with the Spirit. So there, that's the primary evil, really, the evil that resides in us. But there's a second type of evil that we are likely to encounter in the fallen world. The world has been tainted by sin. So yes, we will face the evil of the world. This world is at war with God. It is temporal and it tends to reject the idea of anything eternal. The Bible tells us that we are to live in the world, but not of it. So we can't get out of the world. We're, we're still stuck. We, we go to work. We, we uh, engage with people with a worldly mindset. But we're, we're not supposed to stop that. We're not supposed to, to go and uh, be desert monks. But we can't let their, the world's way of thinking turn us away from Christ. We are not to cozy up with the world's vain philosophies. Instead, we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Then the third type of evil I think that Paul has in mind here is Satan. Now, Satan uh, has come in for a rough time as well because uh, there are a lot of people who don't believe that there is this creature named Satan. And Satan really uh, is a generic term. I'm not sure it's a personal name. It's, uh, what it means is deceiver, the accuser, the, uh, um, the one who comes against us. But uh, there really is a person who is our enemy, who leads forces, spiritual forces against us. And if we don't take Satan seriously, we will end up doing what Satan is leading us to do. He exists, and he's dangerous. The Bible describes Satan as the liar and father of lies, a stumbling block to biblical disciples. He's the tempter. He is a schemer. And Satan's activity in the world leads to death, and destruction. And he's very powerful, supernaturally powerful. But the good news is that there is one being in the world 
who is more powerful than he is, infinitely more powerful than he is. And that's the God we serve. And God makes this power available to us so that we can overcome Satan. But we don't access that power unless we really thoroughly make Scripture a part of us, memorizing Scripture and studying and, and understanding it. We must abide in Christ. We must stay connected with Christ daily. We must submit to God and resist Satan. We must learn how others in the the global church have overcome Satan. We must daily put on the full armor of God through prayer. And best of all, we we need to remind ourselves that Satan has already been defeated. Oh, he's winning some skirmishes here and there, but the battle is done. Uh, the, the war is done. He loses. Read the end of the book. So the flesh, the world, and Satan are three evils that we must not allow ourselves to be overcome by. But not only are we not to let evil overcome us, but we are to actively overcome evil with good. (laughs) That is counterintuitive. How do you be good to someone who is doing you evil? Our our natural response is to hit back when we're hit, right? Somebody pushes us, we push. Somebody threatens us, we threaten. Paul says... You overcome evil with good, not more evil. We extend the same kind of grace to others that we identify as evil as God extended to us. Because we were evil too. We forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. We do not pursue vengeance but we demonstrate kindness to those who oppose us. And our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are facing persecution, maybe at this moment, really show us how to live. They are bold examples of this kind of overcoming faith. This, uh, I've been reading through uh, Voice of the Martyrs, Extreme Devotion. Uh, I recommend this for uh, inspiring stories of how, um, how our brothers and sisters throughout the world have stood up to persecution. Some have died, some have been tortured, uh, some have come th- through that. Uh, but it's all very inspiring. So uh, you get that through the Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, it's a year devotional. You can start at any time. But one of the uh, inspiring stories that I I read about here uh, was a widow in Kenya who stood over her husband's coffin. And there were tears in her eyes, but her voice was strong. And the bruises on her body told the mourners that she too had been beaten. As Christians, she, she and her husband had refused to take a Kikuyu tribal oath that wasn't consistent with their Christian faith. For this, her husband was beaten to death, and she was beaten and hospitalized. And the crowd was still and silenced by the power of the widow's words and her will. She said, I, as his widow, also tell all of you in the presence of my dead husband that I hate none of those who killed him. I love the killers. I forgive them, knowing that Christ has died for them too. 
No one in attendance that day would forget her words. Empowering words. I hope we never have to stand over the coffin of a loved one. But we may have to pay a price to stand firm. But if we stand firm in this overcoming faith, we will overcome evil. Because as I said, in the end, the good wins. When we exercise overcoming faith, we will be on the winning side. We will be victorious. No matter how the enemy responds, they may be able to kill our body, but they cannot kill our soul if we belong to Jesus. And we may have the opportunity to win those who oppose us to Christ. And we will discover the best thing of all, that he who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. Let's pray. Father, um, today we are mindful of those throughout the world, throughout history, uh, who have stood firm with this overcoming faith, we faced persecution, faced torture, faced death. I thank you for the, the, the example they have been to us. I thank you for the strength that you have given them. But Father, I, I also ask your forgiveness that I know I, for one, have neglected to pray for them daily. Lord, I know that they need our prayers. They need to know that their brothers and sisters throughout the world are with them, praying for them, that they might stand firm and not lose their faith, not lose hope. And so we do that. Places like Nigeria, where churches are being burned down and Christians killed through communist countries that uh, by law forbid people to um, meet unless they're authorized by a state church. Or in the Middle East where um, people are threatened to um, become Muslim or else die by the sword. Lord, help our brothers and sisters throughout the world to stand firm, to know the joy of following you even in the midst of all that has come against them. And Father, as we come to the communion table today, let us remember that we are communing with everyone, every Christian throughout the world. We are in solidarity with them. So, I ask that um, in the silence here, in these next few moments, that we will offer our prayers of confession so that we can come to the table with clean hearts, a renewed mind. Let us pray silently this morning um, our prayers of confession. Father, I, 
I thank you for the good news that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we accept that gift. We accept that promise. What a joy it is. And now we pray the prayer that your son taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sorry for the delay. I didn't grab a microphone before. It's Communion Sunday, and here we are gathered, um, as I said, as a universal church in solidarity with those um, who are being persecuted. And on the night that Jesus faced his ultimate persecution, his suffering, his death. He met with his disciples, Passover meal. Passover uh, reminded them of uh, what God had done to deliver them from slavery in Egypt. And Jesus kind of retold the story, tweaked the story. Now he was going to lead... us, his church, out of slavery in much the same way. He would be the lamb who would offer his blood. He would be the sacrifice to lead us out of slavery to sin. And so this is our reminder. This is, this is how we continue to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks to his father and he gave the bread to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body that's broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to his father and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, drink. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we come together to remember Jesus, remember our solidarity with Christians throughout the world. A reminder, uh, In the United Methodist Church, we serve open communion. You do not have to be a member of this church or our denomination to participate. We just ask that that you be a follower of Jesus Christ, that you uh, seek to to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your neighbor as yourself. Um, uh, We will have ushers who will come and dismiss the rows to come up. Um, You gather around the, the, uh, the railing, Uh, You can kneel, you can stand, whatever is comfortable to you. Uh, If you are unable to come to to the front, we will bring the communion elements to you. Um, So um, that is our procedure.
the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat and remember him to him. of Christ shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.
Our closing hymn today is number 534. I think this is a message for us in times of trial, but also might be a skeleton of prayer for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. I know in the song we are talking to ourselves, telling our own souls to calm down, but these might be things you could pray for others, that they will know that God is guiding the future and the past, that their confidence and their hope might not be shaken in the midst of this trial that people are going through around the world. So this is number 534, Be Still My Soul. You may stand if you are able. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. Amen. Shine.